guest at this time is Dr. Jerome Corsi. Of course, he's a senior staff writer for WND, formerly known as WorldNet Daily. I think they go just by WND now, but uh, he's also an investigative reporter, and he's got a couple of articles that we want to talk about. One of these is about uh, smoking gun uh, documents out of Benghazi, related to Benghazi. And also, I want to talk to him about his article exposing that a Soros-funded uh, organization is talking about getting a North American passport. You don't need your American passport anymore, not a United States passport, because remember what David Petraeus said? He said, what comes after America? It's North America. And so we've been seeing these oblique references out in the open lately from Petraeus, from Pelosi, from many people. And of course, this organization went public with an op-ed piece. I think they put it on, um, it was on CNN a couple of days ago. And so uh, Dr. Corsi breaks down who is behind this organization called New America. But first, I want to talk to him about uh, Judicial Watch's uh, Freedom of Information request that got some Benghazi documents and what's behind that. Welcome, Dr. Corsi. Uh, good to be with you, David. Thank you very much. I, uh, both of these articles are very interesting. I want to go to the uh, Benghazi article first. Kind of lay it out for us what Judicial Watch got that's a smoking gun. Well, Judicial Watch has been getting a whole series of articles and um, FOIA requests from the Obama administration that even Congress does not seem able to get. <laughs> now, these uh, documents that I'm reporting on involve the uh, Diplomatic Security Command Center, the DSCC, which is part of the State Department. It's an office in the State Department. And it's responsible for really getting communications coming in from the various embassies if there's any security problems. Now, among the documents that the Judicial Watch got, there was this one document right after September 12th, uh, right after this attack, uh, September 11th, 2012, uh, the State Department sent out an emergency message to the US citizens about demonstrations. This came from our embassy in Tunisia. And again, they were they were blaming the day after uh, the Benghazi attack on this video. <laughs> the message reads, you know, on September 11th, 2012, violent demonstrations took place at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, Egypt, and the U.S. compound in Benghazi, Libya, uh, resulting in damage in both locations and casualties in Benghazi. Um, I, and again. And they're reporting that media reports say that the demonstrations may take place at the embassy in Tunis. The State Department is blaming it on the video the day after the attack. But the problem is that we have testimony now in, uh, uh, in Congress from the DSCC. And specifically, uh, this was testimony that occurred by um, Charlene Lamb, who was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, the House Oversight Committee in October 10th, 2012. And she says and proves that the, the same group within the State Department, the State Department Diplomatic Security Command Center, knew the Benghazi compound was under hostile fire, a terrorist attack from the moment the attack started and was getting real-time reports, including video and other communications. You know, they had a drone over um, the Benghazi attack while the attack was going on. And so what's clear is that the State Department, the same office, was lying to the, to the public in Tunisia and around the world, not letting people know that this was a terrorist attack. And basically, it's irresponsible. It's a you know, dereliction of duty is what Judicial Watch says, because it puts Americans around the world in danger. When you know, you've got Al Qaeda terrorists mm -hmm. attacking the embassy or the compound, it was really not an embassy, but the compound in Benghazi. And here the State Department desk that knew about this is telling our embassies in places like Tunisia that I'll be on the watch because there could be protests about a movie. That just doesn't, that just doesn't reconcile. Go ahead and get your phone, that's, that's yeah. fine. Hold on a yeah. second. As I look at this, I would guess that the smoking gun is really, wouldn't you say that it's more the fact that they really knew that there was an attack going on. And not only did they lie about the origins of the attack after the fact, but the fact that they knew that it was going on and essentially stood down. Is that correct? Well, and they, I mean, there's several things. That's another issue. The mm -hmm. other 
the, the specific smoking gun that I found was that you've got Hillary Clinton's State Department, which has now got through this desk real time information. It's a terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. And instead of letting our embassies around the world know that immediately, they're lying and saying, oh, no, it's all because of a movie. So it puts Hillary Clinton at the center of the cover up that was beginning the day after, maybe even the day of the attack. And this documentary evidence, you know, is going to be very hard for Hillary to wiggle out of because she's head of the State Department and that you've got the desk watching the attack going on real time, putting out bulletins to our embassies the next day in Tunisia saying, you know, watch out for another demonstration against the movie. This was not a demonstration. Oh, that movie was absolutely ridiculous. Oh. First of all, nobody had ever heard of it. Uh, if you ever <laughs> see any clips of it on, on YouTube, you won't, I mean, and, Muslims and, would have to have absolutely no sense of humor not to even laugh at something that was that poorly produced, that crude, that ridiculous. I mean, it is, and maybe they don't, some of these organizations, but that wasn't even known by them. That wasn't something that they were upset about. It was, and, it was a ludicrous and, narrative from the very beginning. And the key point is that if you take a look at the Benghazi attack, you've got the State Department watching it. Remember, we had drones, we had a drone over Benghazi while the attack was going on. We were able to see what was happening yes. in Washington. And you had attackers showing up with rocket propelled grenades and AK 47s. And these were, you know, very heavily armed terrorists. Well, let me ask you this, Dr. Corsi, because we've had people like uh, Dr. Pachinik on and others who have flat out said that they believe that this was internecine fighting between different factions within our government, different factions within the CIA, some of them who wanted to arm Al Qaeda and ISIS, others who wanted to see that stopped, depending on which side these guys are on. Do you think that there was something like that going on with this? Well, I mean, I've been reporting on the uh, Citizens Committee on Benghazi, which is a group of you know really top former military commanders and intelligence officers and media experts. And you know, um, you've got people like Admiral Lyons on the group, um, General Vallely on the group. These are these are very distinguished military commanders with long careers. And the you know basic scenario that I reported on again, WND, that Admiral Lyons believes is that this was a attempt to you know to capture. It was a kidnapping gone terribly wrong to get. Because we had already supported Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. we were through Hillary Clinton, the State Department, even before Gaddafi was toppled in 2011, we'd been getting guns in through Benghazi from Turkey and distributing them into these same Al Qaeda affiliated militias like the Ansar yes. al Sharia, who was doing the attack on the Benghazi compound. Now, you've got to ask why would Ansar al Sharia suddenly attack the compound when, you know, Chris Stevens is one of their best friends, he's getting them weapons. Mm -hmm. Well, the I think the ar argument is that the Obama administration, uh, going back to when Morsi first took office in 2011 in Egypt, had been pressuring Obama to release the blind sheik, who is the guy we have in prison that was trying to master, did mastermind the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. Uh, he was prosecuted and is now on a lifetime sentence at a US prison. And Morsi in Egypt, Muslim Brotherhood won him back, and Obama was trying to release him. All the efforts were failing, and you know there was no consensus in America that we ought to release a terrorist of this magnitude. So Obama was being opposed in his efforts, and they were all published in the newspaper at the time. Very, very widely known that Obama was trying to release the blind sheik. Then this attack occurs, and of course, the idea of trying to get a kidnapping, uh, you know, the, you've got to ask why did why did we not? Accede to the request being made by Christopher Stevens to give him greater security. You know, why was US forces all across the world told not to mobilize and go to the aid in Benghazi when we had forces in the region? You know, it sounds mm -hmm. like we were leaving um, Chris Stevens in this compound, this diplomatic. It sounded like compound. they wanted to get rid of him, didn't it? Well, or that they yeah. were making him vulnerable. He was being mm -hmm. put out there as a attractive target that could be snatched. Mm -hmm. And if you read the 13 hours, and one of the things I think in the account from the uh, global resources guys who went from the annex 
disobeyed orders, got in two vehicles and went over to the diplomatic compound, was that, you know, they say that this was a attack that had gone wrong. It was basically set up. They wondered if it was a kidnapping when they entered. My, my phone has been like this. It's been, I've been, <laughs> That's I've right. been these That's right. So your, your take on it is not so much that necessarily that it was an internecine fighting between these two different groups, uh, one who wants to arm the terrorists, ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, which we know a lot of arms have, have uh, were flowing out of uh, that area to Al-Qaeda prior to the attack and certainly afterwards. But that they were trying, that they wanted the ambassador to get uh, kidnapped so well, they could yeah. have an excuse to do a prisoner trade with the blind sheik. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that the evidence is pointing in that direction. It's mm -hmm. going to have to be investigated. We don't have the documents yet to prove it. But when you say it's a circumstantial case, but when you try to explain, you know, why would Al Qaeda groups that we had been supporting, remember, Obama changed sides in, ben, in Libya. We began, Obama made a decision and he issued a presidential finding, he signed it, that we were going to arm Al Qaeda when we were supposedly at war with Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. They turned down, and this again, the CCB, the, the Citizens Commission of Benghazi had reported on, they had turned down an offer to abdicate. You had Gaddafi saying, I'll leave. I don't need to Hang be. Hang on, Dr. Corsi, we've got to go to commercial break. And I also, once we come back, we're going to talk about the North American Union. That's another massive plot. Of course, what was going on in Benghazi? They're perfectly capable of anything. They will lie, cover up, and conspire. We're going to be right back with Dr. Jerome Corsi. Stay with us. Dr. Jerome Corsi from WND.com. We were just talking in the last segment about a uh, article that's up there a smoking gun uh, document from uh, about Benghazi that was obtained by Judicial Watch. And uh, Dr. Corsi was breaking that down. We talked a little bit about what he thinks uh, might have been behind uh, the Benghazi incident. But Dr. Corsi, let's move on to this other article that you've got, which really concerns me. Actually, this concerns me even more so because I know that the, uh, the government elites are constantly engaged in their Machiavellian <laughs> Uh, fighting within each other and running uh, terrorist groups that they're then protecting us from. But another aspect of all this, of course, is the uh, consolidation into trading blocks that we've seen happen with the North American Union. And now they're at the next step, trying to consolidate the North American Union with uh, Europe and with Asian countries, just with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's about 40% of the world's economy right there that they're trying to uh, pull in and control because it's not really about free trade. You don't create a secret document uh, about free trade and not let anybody see it, a multi-thousand uh, page document that you ram through under fast track. No, this is not about exports unless you're talking about exporting jobs and exporting sovereignty. But we can see how this is playing out with the North American Union as they're working on the very next level of consolidation. And we see how poorly this has worked out for Americans with the uh, North American Union. They're now talking about getting rid of U.S. passports and substituting North American Union passports. Uh, talk about this organization that's uh, put this uh, piece out on CNN, why we need a North American passport. Well, the, the group is the uh, New America Foundation. It's a Washington-based uh, think tank. It's Jonathan Soros, the son of you know, the billionaire George Soros, is on the board. It's a Soros-backed organization. It has money even from the State Department. It's a heavily financed organization. And they printed an article in their publications that was picked up uh, by CNN that says that we should make the U.S. passport obsolete because the shared destinies of the three countries, Mexico, Canada, and the United States would be to create a North American passport. And I'll quote, you know, that would allow citizens to travel, work, invest, learn, and innovate anywhere in North America. Mm. Tourists and student visas, you know, not necessary. So, I mean, this is advancing the agenda that I've Criticized now, the late Robert Pastor passed away last year from American University. Have been championing a North American Union, and it's a bipartisan effort. I mean, George W. Bush had the Security and Prosperity Partnership in North America since 2005, uh, and not declared by Congress, no treaty, no law. And I put in the article now Barack Obama when he announced the relationships with Cuba, and he's saying from the White House in Spanish. You know, total somos americanos. We're all Americans. And yes. so 
Yes. We There's, had Nancy yeah. Pelosi say we have one community of people that just happens to have a border running through it. If you want to understand what's going on with the open borders, if you want to understand why neither the Democrats nor the Republicans will do anything about this, the answer is NAFTA. And it's the, the globalist agenda, which is an agenda for the central bankers yes. around the world. It's an agenda for the multinational corporations. It pushes labor to slave labor. You know, it's why we see the deterioration in America of the middle class. How well are we doing since NAFTA? And it's it's about you know, it's George H. W. Bush, it's Bill Clinton, it's George, it's George W. Bush, and now it's Barack Obama. And uh, and I think you're going to see uh, remarkably that the GOP in Congress will support President Obama on fast track authority to get this very secretive Trans-Pacific Partnership through, and the Democrats will oppose Obama. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we've already heard, and I, was, I mentioned it yesterday, I was very disappointed to hear Rand Paul right after the election start talking about how we needed to do this because we need to do a boost to our economy. Listen, the only thing, as I said before, that we're going to be exporting are jobs and sovereignty. It's about exporting our sovereignty. It's the same thing that we see with Agenda 21. We talked to Rosa Corey yesterday. Listen to the very first sentence on this op-ed piece that uh, New America uh, Organization put on CNN. The future of the United States lies in North America. They're not talking about it being geographic. They said this is not a geographic truism. It is a strategic imperative. So it's essential for them to now consolidate the North American Union because they're going to the next step. They're taking that uh, they want to consolidate us with uh, Europe as well as with uh, Asia with these secretly negotiated uh, trade agreements. They call them trade agreements. It's far beyond that. That's what's really concerning me, Dr. Corsi. Well, and also it's the same stealth plan that was used in Europe. Yes. I, you know, go back to the European coal and steel agreement that was signed as a treaty in Paris in 1951. And, and Jean Monnet and the other architects of the European Union swore right after World War II that this was only economic agreements. Oh, yeah, that's right. Only economics. It is far beyond that. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Jerome Corsi. Stay with us right after the break. We're going to take your calls on We're these on subjects. 800-259-9231. The Thank you, Dr.